Welcome back to Copper of the World 2022. Hopefully you've had a chance to get a cup of tea or coffee and get yourself ready for our next session. So just a reminder to pop your questions in the chat box and there'll also be a poll uh, as part of this session as well, but I'll get to that in a second. So our next speaker today is Tim Gerard, Portfolio Manager within the suite of Global Natural Resource Strategies at Janus Henderson Investors. Tim joined Janus as a senior investment analyst in 2015 when the company acquired 90 West Asset Management. Prior to that, Tim has extensive experience in the investment market, working for Lonsec Securities, conducting sell-side research targeted to the institutional market, working at Investec Securities and Austec Securities with research targeted to global and Australian institutions. Tim has also held stock broking positions at North Securities, Potts West Turnbull, Prue Bash and BNP Paribus. When we asked Tom to speak today, we had a very interesting discussion on the increased importance of ESG in copper investment and how that is going to affect the industry going forward. So I know that his presentation today is going to provide you with some wonderful insights and knowledge on this topic. And the poll question we're going to run during this session is ESG related. The question is, ESG continues to rise up the agenda in boardrooms of mining companies. How should miners be reacting to this trend? So don't forget to vote on the poll and also add your questions to the, to the box as we go, and we'll get to them at the end of Tim's presentation. So Tim, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you for that introduction and welcome everyone to the 2022 COPPER um, to the Rural Conference. It's, very, uh, it's, a great, it's a great topic and um, hope to give you some insights from Janice Henderson. Um, Janice Henderson, we're a global fund manager. We look after about 400 billion US. It sounds pretty large, but it's it's moderately large, but it's not up there with the majors. Um, and we have offices in Denver and London, Singapore, Sydney and Melbourne, to, to name a few places. Uh, our little team of four people, we look after a billion dollars uh, in resources. And hopefully this presentation today will will give you a little bit of a, um, a helicopter view and some insights as to how we look at um, the copper sector. And the copper sector, I think Mr. Friedland from Ivanhoe came out with a good, um, a good point the other day. He said that to date, through history, 700 million tonnes of copper has been produced. Um, because of the opportunities in front of us now, those opportunities that I'll discuss, that 700 million tonnes produced to date is going to have to be replicated in just 22 years. Clearly, we're in a really interesting environment at the moment. Um, there's a lot of new demand for copper. A lot of that demand is coming from the transition to net zero. And this transition to net zero has been, has been driven all around the world uh, by the realization that the time has passed to be debating about whether global warming is occurring or not. That debate has moved on. The debate now is how to mitigate and control and reduce that global warming. Um, uh, we, in line with that, the whole ESG has come up over the last, as recently as the last three to four years, ESG is magnified in importance. The ESG, is, of course, stands for environmental, social, and governance. Um, companies are no longer just about profits per se. Uh, it's about the environment. Thank God that's the case. Um, governance and social, including communities and the right to water. There's a lot of massive changes that's really come to a head over the last three to four years. And a lot of those changes um, come about through the realization that climate change is real and that we as a planet must look after our environment and our people a lot better. And it's no longer just purely about profit. These are massive changes. Copper is absolutely essential to this transition to net zero. As part of that, net zero for 2050 sounds like a long, long way away. 
Um, but as the European demonstrated, European Union uh, demonstrated back in 2020, they came up with a new stimulus, um, new stimulus that coincided with COVID. And this stimulus was linked uh, to the Green Deal, which was really about the realization if the world was going to decarbonize, it would have to do it um, with a real sense of urgency. And up until 2020, and then last year, and then last year's 20, um, uh, 2021 COP conference, uh, there was no real sense of urgency. But when the European Union came out and said, look, we need to reduce our carbon emissions by 2030, we want to reduce our emissions by 55%, not 30 or 35%. Um, there was a realization that people had to, had to act urgently. And to some extent, the companies were already doing this. Um, but government policy has started to catch up. We've seen the US join um, uh, the Paris Agreement uh, back in 2021. We've seen China say, this sounds a long, long way away, but China say they'll be serious about reducing emissions uh, before 2060. In actual fact, we think that'll happen a, a lot sooner. And then you've got India saying by 2070. So there's a, a cascade um, of policy changes coming. And from our point of view, 2030 was when a lot of the action is going to happen. And, we've, and we realize um, there's good money to be made by making sound investments to help the world decarbonize. And a lot of those big moves are going to be made ahead of 2030, which after all, is pretty close. It's, it's not that far away from an investments um, viewpoint. It's of course going to be very challenging to decarbonize. Um, the energy mix is essentially fossil fuels. Uh, this chart shows you here on the, the left-hand side, um, the, the amount of energy that we're going to require through to 2050, that sort of that, that layering effect there, um, it's going to be pretty constant. The world's going to need at least the amount of energy we're consuming now, if not more. Uh, but at the same time, the carbon emissions from fossil fuels are going to have to go down from 34 gigatons um, to something like 10 gigatons. So there's going to be massive reductions in um, fossil fuels. What does that really mean? It really means massive increases to um, renewables, uh, solar and wind, which are now economical uh, and zero, more or less zero emitters of carbon. So renewables replacing fossil fuels, that has massive implications for copper. Um, it's got implications for the likes of this slide came from BHP, but the number of um, EVs, electric vehicles, there might be 5 million in the world now. Uh, well, they're going to head towards over $2 billion. And the rate of penetration of electric vehicles is far higher than what the world has been expecting to date. Um, one in 50 homes might be heated at the moment by solar and wind. Well, 2050, 2040, that could be one in three. And incidentally, um, the world is going to have to reforest. There's going to be a whole lot of afforestation. And the need for um, new forestry, I've got to say, this hasn't got much to do with copper, but it's pretty interesting. We're going to have to have new forests that cover half the area of Australia in order to help the world decarbonize. So, Net zero by 2050, it's going to be challenging, but it's going to open up a whole host of new opportunities. Those new opportunities, all to do with energy transition, or a lot to do with energy transition. Now, by the by, with ESG, environmental, social, and governance, um, big themes within that's going to be decarbonization. Boards are going to have to get their head around the, the urgency of it. Uh, there's going to be um, the realization that we have to treat the environment environment more friendly, um, and then and then we've got um, a whole lot of environmental. We've got, not just got the environmental issues, uh, but we've got the social issues to do with water and communities. Um, 
within these five buckets, we have a fund called the um, J0 Transition Fund. Uh, that's a flagship fund for us uh, to do with decarbonisation. And the buckets that we invest in uh, have to do with uh, the energy transition, uh, sustainable mobility, sustainable ag agriculture, um, uh, which includes alternative proteins, sustainable industry, which includes uh, recycling, and then carbon reduction via reforestation. With respect to copper, what we're really interested in is this energy transition. Uh, copper is an enabler to enable renewable energy. It enables energy storage uh, and grid and power generation. And copper enables electric vehicles, obviously low carbon transport. So copper, copper very important to the move to decarbonisation. Before I get on to some copper examples, just to give you an idea of how we in, in Janus Centers and Natural Resources look at our companies. Um, after all, we got to screen about 6,000 companies and we get that down to a portfolio of say 50 stocks. Um, part of that is negative screening. Some of lots of our portfolios, we're not including oil and gas, uh, that's negative screening. Um, and, and a lot of our companies, we want to be of a sizable market capitalization, often greater than five or $10 billion. Um, and we want good liquidity. After all, if, if clients want to withdraw their money quickly, um, we, don't want to be, uh, we don't want to be stuck with small quality illiquid um, um, stocks. With respect to the stock selection themselves, when we look at copper companies, for instance, we want mines that are low cost. Um, we want mines with long lives. Now, now why is that? Um, resources are typically very, very volatile. Uh, we go through cycles, maybe every five or seven years. There's a lot of volatility in prices. Um, we don't want to be investing in a company that's, uh, that's got a low grade deposit, um, and a low life deposit, a short life deposit. It just means that if some, if some trouble hits the world, those companies are not going to survive being short, short cycle companies with poor cash flows. So it's very important to have high cash flows, which is supported really by low costs and long lives. Um, we also don't like going into companies for much the same reason that have high debt. So we can screen out a lot of companies using those three measures. Of course, we want good quality management. We, we want management that gets the emergency, the climate emergency, and works with their boards to come up with plans to reduce their own carbon emissions. Uh, we want management that can work with communities. Um, and then we come down to things like valuation, NPV, net present value, uh, that tends to be how we value these copper companies. We want copper companies with growth. And then we want companies that have um, optionality, not just through growth, but there could be catalysts that come up that kick up the share price either because of expiration success. Um, there could be takeovers at a premium. There could be um, de-risking of the time due development. Uh, and funds that accelerate uh, the move to development. All of these things help de-risk and we're looking for companies uh, that can do that. Now, by the time we do all that, it's not, it's not too difficult to come down to, you know, maybe a hundred companies and then we choose the best 50 that give us the optionality, that give us the diversification. We'd, we'd rather have companies with multi mines than single mines. And we also want to be geographically diversified. So that go, gives you some measure of, of the sifting process in our portfolio. And then overlaying that, we of course, ESG, the environment, social and governance, we want really measurable outcomes. Companies have to be serious on that. They've got to be serious on climate change or water security, culture and diversity. You've seen the importance of that um, after Rio Tinto dropped the ball at um, Jucan Caves and WA. We want companies to be 
um, uh, good tax transparency. Uh, the Australians, the BHP and Rio's are, are very good at that. We want minimal controversies. All of that's important and company engagement is very important. To help with the company engagement, we have we we call on our colleagues in London. We've got a team over there of um, forty professionals, ESG professionals. They help um, uh, with governance and voting. Um, we're in regular contact with those guys. Uh, we use uh, third party uh, research like sustainable sustainalytics or MISCI, uh, and those those sort of services highlight uh, the carbon footprint of a company. Uh, this so-called glide path is the company taking enough carbon out of the atmosphere to uh, to enable their sector to meet long-term targets. Uh, they 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 raise red flags on um, maybe community issues or safety issues. All of this measurement engagement is all part of the ESG. We look at the carbon footprint. We make sure companies are aligned with sustainability themes. Uh, we want to see progress. Proxy voting is important. All of these things, each company goes through these sorts of measures. It's not just a matter of us buying the company and sitting on it and holding with no engagement. Uh, engagement is really important. Issues might come up with respect to um, corruption or poor environmental performance or lagging carbon, um, um, carbon emission reductions, would pick up the phone and have a chat with the MD uh, and see if they can explain their situation to us. We record that and we make that information available through our group. So engagement, very important. Coming back, coming back to copper, um, just to give you some idea, and even if we just look at India and Asia, ASEAN, um, geography, you can see that these these geographies only one or two kilograms of capita of copper consumption per capita uh, versus China and Japan more like 10. Now since this slide has been done, uh, we've got a whole new growth um, coming up in renewables and that's going to see a market increase in per capita increase uh, of copper consumption in the developing world. An example of the energy transition that we can use to just demonstrate the importance of copper is, is offshore wind. Um, and this is offshore wind just from, just from uh, Europe, the European Union. Uh, you can see there currently 12 gigawatts going to 60 by 2030, um, five times. And then another five times, even under a downside scenario to 300 gigawatts by 2050. This is just the European Union. Now, each gigawatt of that offshore wind is going to require 15 tons of copper. So just to get to the 300 gigawatts by 2050, let alone the 500, um, the 600, there's 6 million tons of additional copper required in the European Union just, just for offshore wind turbines. And those offshore wind turbines, when they get connected to the, um, to the mainland, you're going to have cables as thick as your forearm, as thick as your wrist. Um, and I'm talking about a big person's wrist, not a small person's wrist. So there's going to be a lot of copper demand from offshore wind. And just the power of wind, just to, just to highlight an example for you, we have Vestas in the portfolio, and Vestas is a producer of wind turbines. Um, and their portfolio of turbines um, takes out or enables the world to avoid about 200 million tons of carbon dioxide emissions every year. Um, and their portfolio is expanding. This will be one of the companies uh, that will be instrumental in that offshore wind um, industry offshore in the European Union. 200 million tons a year of carbon avoided that carbon couldn't be avoided um, without the use of copper. And of course, there's a lot, lot of debate about, well, all that copper is helping avoid, um, uh, is helping to displace um, carbon dioxide,
But of course, other things are also helping to displace the carbon dioxide, other materials used in the wind turbine. Um, the wind turbine company, in this case, Vestas, they want to be carbon neutral by 2030. And you can imagine the pressure that that puts on the copper suppliers. Vestas doesn't want to buy copper from a, from a company uh, that's, a, that's a big polluter and still relies on fossil fuel to produce a copper metal. So at the margin, all the new copper being produced is going to have to have a low carbon footprint because if it doesn't, companies like Vestas are not going to be buying it. Copper is also important for sustainable mobility. When we think sustainable mobility, we're really talking EVs or electric vehicles. Um, and the copper required in an EV, this is an American slide, sorry, on the right hand side, it's in pounds. But basically, a conventional car, in, 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 um, um, conventional in, in internal combustion engine car, ICE, probably needs, it needs about 25 kilograms of copper. A battery electric vehicle is going to need about 90 kilograms of copper. Um, and when you consider uh, back, in this, back in this time, some 60% of car sales were predicted to be um, EVs by 2040. If anything, that's accelerated. So what this means is a lot of new copper uh, that's going to be um, just in EVs alone. Um, EV, the penetration rate is accelerating. It's probably going to be quicker than expected by 2030. Um, the conventional cars plus the EVs, um, you need about Back in 2020, you needed 2 million tons of copper um, uh, for, for EVs and conventional cars. Um, as a result of the explosion in EVs and the increased intensity, probably going to need, according to UBS, probably going to need 4.5 million tons a year of copper by 2030. And, the, and various countries have got different um, policy settings to encourage that. So copper, what's some examples of the key exposure in our, in our um, sector? Um, we like Freeport, we like um, Anglo-American, we like Turquoise Hill and Ivanhoe. So Ivanhoe and Turquoise Hill, slightly higher risk, they're single geographies, but they're large scale, but they're adding volume right now. And then we like Anglo-American and Freeport McMoran. Freeport McMoran's got plenty of growth in America, which is important for the American security supply. And Anglo-American has good growth potential in, in South America. So these are the large scale companies we like right now. They can meet some of this increasing copper demand right now, and they have the flexibility um, to add volume over time. There's many, there's many parts um, in copper, there's many moving parts that are a feature of what's going on now. Um, there's risks to supplies, the community and, and um, water issues uh, extend permitting to at least 10 years. So to get a new mine going, it can take 10 years at a time when we've never seen stronger demand. Um, Peru and Chile give examples of possible constitutional changes and the need to share more equi equitably um, profits from the copper industry. Communities concerned about water and participation. While all this is happening globally, you'll be well aware mine grades are declining um, and at the same time takes multi, multi years to add new capacity. Luckily, this new demand picture, um, as the world decarbonizes, we no longer just rely on China. Importantly, um, importantly, this global, this demand for additional copper is global, and it's no longer just driven by the Chinese. This new geographies coming to the forefront. Coming to the forefront, Ecuador and and Argentina. Um, and importantly, major corporates are now getting ready to reset 
their books with acquisitions and portfolio and joint venture deals. Uh, we've seen Rio Tinto build, um, bidding for Turquoise Hill. BHP spinning off oil and gas. It's likely to want to invest 15 billion in new copper opportunities. And these acquisitions, companies wanting companies new, companies wanting new companies are going to want opportunities with low carbon footprints. This is the last slide. I'll finish off on this. Uh, in conclusion, um, copper matters. Copper is going to matter in us reaching accelerated targets by of 55% uh, for the European Union and other countries. Um, it's happening right now. There's new demand, there's tight supply, and the risk is that copper prices are going to be on the upside. But I'd hasten to add, copper is just part of our portfolio. Commodities are volatile, but this is a very important part of the portfolio. Over to you and thanks for the opportunity to present. Thanks, Tim, for your insights uh, on that complicated and uh, increasingly important topic. So just a reminder to those online, if you have a question for Tim, we've got a few questions coming through, Tim, so I'll, I'll get to those shortly. But um, if you'd like to uh, pop a question in the chat box, um, please feel free to do so. Uh, so, Tim, our, our first question that's come through is, what is your outlook on nuclear power for baseload to support grids with integrated renewables? All right, look, our, our, our view on nuclear is that we're not going to get to net zero by 2050 without nuclear. Um, and, and so Germany's probably made a mistake by phasing out nuclear early. Uh, we've seen that with the implications of the Ukrainian-Russian war. Um, but I, we've already seen that China is well ahead on nuclear. There's bipartisan support in, in, um, in the US now. I think nuclear is going to be critical to achieving net zero. Okay, excellent. Thanks, Tim. Uh, our next question. Uh, is it a realistic prospect that mining industry will be able to un sorry, will be able to satisfy the stupendous projected copper demand? If so, what gives? How much risk of substitution is there? Um, I I think frankly. I can't really see how the mining industry is going to satisfy this huge increase in demand. I mean, if if we were 20 years ago and if there was less um, ESG uh, and less, less concern by the general populace um, about the environment, then possibly. But now the environment is forefront in, in, in the population's mind. Biodiversity is critical. Uh, we've done a lot of damage to the earth and it's not too late to reverse that damage. But but in the process of reversal, it's going to take years and years to get permitting. Um, uh, think about oil and gas in the, in the um, in Saudi Arabia might produce oil at $2 a barrel. It sells at $100 a barrel because um, demand stipulates that that's what's required. Um, the same kind of thing, not the same magnitude, but the price of copper could go up two or three or even four times. Uh, and that itself has to drive substitution, um, wherever that comes from, and it has to drive increased recycling. So I think the answer to your question is, there's going to be a portfolio, we'll go through periods of excessive copper prices, maybe $10 a pound, uh, that, that encourage a lot more recycling and a lot more um, and a lot more careful husbanding of the use of copper, including alternatives. I think it's got to be a mix of lots of things. Yeah. Okay. Thanks for that. Um, I've got another parochial South Australian question here for you. Uh, what is Janice's view on Australian copper companies as they didn't appear in the presentation? <laughs> <laughs> that's a that's a that's a fair point, and and I would say I would say Oz Oz Minerals has been a, you know, it's good a performer as any of those um, other companies that we've got more or less, um, and I think we've got to be alert to opportunities. Um, Oz Minerals is one of those. Uh, we're certainly looking at Australian companies, but I, I suppose 
some of these big overseas ones that the order of magnitude of the resources are just so impressive. Um, it's hard for us. It's hard for us not to be invested in those. But given Oz Minerals has an excellent ESG, it's got good growth prospects. I, I think we've got to be alert to Australian opportunities, and I don't see any reason why we won't have some, you know, sooner rather than later. Excellent. Thanks, Tim. Um, another question here. So again, quite project specific, this one, but how long do you expect it to take Anglo-American to overcome their issues at Los, Los Bronces following the recent rejection of their environmental permit application? Uh, I, look, I think that's a, a good question. And we we have, one of the reasons we have Anglo-American is, is because of its growth option uh, optionality. And Las Broncos was one of was one of those projects. Um, mm. So I think this is a good example. It could take many, many years. Um, that project is not that far away from glaciers. Uh, there's maybe a moratorium on developments close to glaciers. I think that's just a good example. I wouldn't like to give a time. Uh, I previously, uh, six months ago, I might have said five years. Now I'd be a lot less certain. Yeah, okay. and, and that's one of the reasons why companies like Anglo-American, they'll be in the marketplace looking for alternatives in Argentina or, or Ecuador. Yeah, yeah. Uh, another question for you then. So how does green hydrogen fit into the new world? Will it have widespread use in liquid fuel replacement, such as heating and transport or stationary generation? And do you believe the hype? Oh, look, I mean, there's a, there's a lot of hype. I mean, there's one company in particular is an expert at hype. Um, and I think, uh, you know, that's not necessarily good. Um, but green hydrogen, remember, you've got grey hyd hydrogen, which is coming from, um, coming from fossil fuels. Blue hydrogen is a result of uh, hydrogen being produced with the carbon being captured. And blue hydrogen and green hydrogen comes from renewables. I think hydrogen is going to be absolutely critical. Um, maybe for stationary um, energy and storage. But I think the first area in which green hydrogen is going to be absolutely critical is heavy transport like um, buses and trucks. We've already seen good companies, white, you know, leaders in the area like Air Products, APD, the best hydrogen company in the world, is spending $12 billion on four different projects to produce green hydrogen. Um, and, and one of those biggest projects is only like 250,000 tons a year of hydrogen. That's the biggest in the world. So this is very early days. Um, uh, I think it's too early to, to call, you know, a lot of it is hype, but the best companies are doing it now. It's going to be ultra important, but it's really a byproduct of, of the renewables being economic. So hydrogen is going to be critical and it's going to be critical for heavy vehicles mainly. Yeah, okay, oh, that's great. Thank you for your response. So we've, we've got some questions coming in thick and fast now. So if you've got some, some more time, I'm happy to keep oh, asking no, you. Good. I, like, I like all these <laughs> questions. Normally we hardly get any. <laughs> no, you've uh, stirred everybody up now. That's good to see. Uh, so another question then is, how does Janus ass assess the financial return for strong ESG companies versus the not so strong companies? Conventional wisdom would suggest that a company with lower ESG standards may have less production costs and therefore higher return on capital. So I guess it's it's balancing that uh, in return on investment as opposed to you know ESG credentials. Yeah, I mean, I'd I'd, I'd like to say we've got a you know like a, a detailed proprietary black box that kind of helps us with all of that. I, I really would, and that's probably a good long term project. Uh, and there's a lot of debate about whether, um, you know, ES, ESG is going to dilute returns or not. I, th I think it just comes back down to the key point. Um, in the old days, it was only returns. And those, those days are gone. If you're an oil and gas company um, and you're still just doing oil and gas, you'll have great returns. Um, if half of your business and you stay all in gas, then you'll have returns better than everyone else. If you make half your business um, renewables, then your return profile on those renewables is probably going to half. 
And so you might have, you know, end up with three quarters of the returns that a typical oil and gas only company has. So a company has to make its own minds up about what its values are. And then the sh potential shareholders make its own minds up about what their values are. And if your values are only returns, then stick with the oil and gas. If your values are deeper than just returns, then that might require a compromise. And in our view, that compromise is a must. I'm willing to make that compromise because I don't want the world to be any worse. Mm. And the other way of looking at it is the share price of companies um, that are strong in ESG. Generally speaking, they'll do better than companies that are weak in ESG. And the other way of looking at it is the strong ESG companies have less risk attached to them, to their businesses, more risk um, to the poor quality ESG companies, including reputational risk um, and the risk that shareholders will walk away. And that means weaker share prices. Mm. Yeah, no worries. Thanks. Um, I guess that, that balancing, uh, you know, good ESG performance versus other as aspects of companies' activities uh, is, is pretty important. And we, there's a question come through around um, a balancing of a safety record in, in coal mining operations versus good ESG. So I guess that probably touches on some of the the comments you made before about you know where is the shareholder value and you know what's important to shareholders you share any thoughts on that so that balancing you know operations that maybe uh you know don't have such a good record like for example around safety versus you know a strong esg recommendation yes yeah look um i think it's interesting when back in the day when we thought of esg and you know we've been all we've been investing in mining companies for a long time. I guess when we thought of ESG, say ten years ago, it was all about safety. Um, uh, we didn't like investing in companies that didn't have good safety programs or had poor safety records. It was very very hard to invest in a deep South African gold miner uh, or or a you know a, a Chinese coal company. If, tens of thousands of people were dying in those industries over, you know, over multiple years. So safety was really important and it still re is really important, but it's now just another one of those measures like safety, community respect, um, uh, procurement, uh, sharing water resources, helping build water resources for communities, all of that balance. We, we talk about balance, but if, if anything, it should be a bias on the upside. You, you, you can't afford to be taking shortcuts on any of that, including safety. Uh, so it's all part of the ESG matrix. And now joined into that is the carbon footprint of a company. Um, it, I, I know it sounds incredibly complex, but this is now in, um, commerce, um, capitalism, it's, it's, it's far more far, it's far reaching now. It, there's a lot more community engagement. People are concerned about the behavior of companies. So um, the cost of not doing safety correctly or carbon emissions correctly is that you're going to lose whatever balance you thought you had anyway. Yeah, excellent. That's great, Tim. Well, thanks very much for that. So we've reached uh, time on this session. So thank you to everybody who's posted questions online and thanks, Tim, for, for your time, your presentation and, and your response to the questions. So uh, I think that, uh, you know, the issues that you've raised are, are going to be a massive part of, uh, you know, the mining industry uh, for years to come and something we need to start coming to grips with. And so, again, we thank you for your insights. Um, just a reminder that the poll there is running, so feel free to pop your responses into that. Uh, Thank and, you. Thanks very much Thank again, Tim. Okay, Appreciate thanks it. for the opportunity. See you later. No worry. Thanks. Okay. So I think we need to, uh, people need to log out of this session and into the next session. Um, so we'll just give that a couple of time to kick through and then I will introduce our next speaker uh, is Andrea Vacari from Freeport McMoran. So if Andrea is a Director for Responsible uh, Production Frameworks and Sustainability at Freeport. Andrea has spent most of her career in mining and metals industry in sustainability, 
and operational roles. In the role she currently is, she works internally and externally across the copper value chain with operators, suppliers, customers and other stakeholders to advance responsible production. This includes leading a team that is addressing the challenges of responsible sourcing, human rights, assurance, product stewardship and climate change. Andrea holds a joint honours degree, BES in Environmental and Resource Studies and Physical Geography from the University of Waterloo in Canada. She is chair of the ICA Material Stewardship Council, co-chair of the Copper Mark Advisory Council and the Mining and Metal Subject Editor for the International Journal of Life Cycle Assessment. So just another reminder that you can post your questions in the chat box at, at any stage. And now we'll hand over to uh, Andrea.